Hi, and welcome to the American Indian Community House's summer exhibition here on Governor's Island at the Admiral's House. I'm Monica Buckle, and here with me today is the fine art photographer, Jeremy Dennis of the Shinnecock Indian Nation. Welcome, Jeremy, and thank you for giving up your time today to be here. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. The conversation today, we're going to explore Jeremy's artistic themes about indigenous identity, assimilation, and contemporary perceptions about Native American culture. This is the American Indian Community House's 50th year of operation. We're the longest operating Native nonprofit in New York City, so it's a pleasure that we have such a residency here at Governor's Island in a presence for the summer. Before we proceed with our discussion, I would like to briefly mention the history of Governor's Island. Governor's Island is the land of the Lenape. Prior to European contact, the Lenape inhabited the lands of southern New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. The Lenape called Governor's Island Paganak, translating to Nut Island, with the indigenous chestnut, oak, and hickory trees that are native to this island. In 1524, Giovanni de Verrazzano was the first European to observe and make mention of the island in European records. Precisely 100 years later, in 1624, the island was the first landing place for Dutch settlers. The island remained in Dutch possession until it was ceded to the British in 1674. The Dutch used the island for farming and the British used it to raise game. The American Revolution ensued, and in 1776, the Continental Army took possession of the island and has remained in possession of the United States ever since, primarily used for military defense and fortification of New York Harbor until the 1990s. Today, it's currently operated by the National Park Service and the state of New York. Now, Jeremy, with a brief background of Governor's Island and the rightful land inhabitants, um, this is the perfect time to introduce you as a contemporary Shinnecock artist. Jeremy received his master's in fine art from Pennsylvania State University and holds a Bachelor of Arts from Stony Brook University. Jeremy is the recipient of several grants from the Getty Images, Running Strong for American Indian Youth, and was awarded a grant for On This Site, a project that Jeremy uses photography and an online interactive map to showcase culturally significant Native American sites on Long Island. He has exhibition presence at the Parish Art Museum, the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art, the Wallace Gallery at SUNY College, and cite Santa Fe to name a few. Your work has an inherent connectedness to the land of Eastern Long Island. Being raised on the Shinnecock Reservation and still residing on the reservation, how has that experience shaped your personal sense of indigenous identity? Uh, having grown up on the eastern end of Long Island and on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation, I've always had a sense that um, there's been a lot of gaps that we need to fill mm -hmm. regarding who we are and how we define ourselves as a people. Mm -hmm. And um, ever since high school, I remember people wondering whether or not we live in uh, wigwams or teepees. So even very basic um, ideas of who we are mm -hmm. sort of need to be demystified and a new understanding is required. And for me, that's very motivating. Um, another thing about living on the eastern end of Long Island is that um, even our neighbors in Southampton are sometimes surprised that there's an Indian reservation right uh, in their own community. Interesting. Interesting. Well, that brings me to our next question. The Shinnecock Nation received federal recognition in 2010. What form of feedback has the Shinnecock tribal members and the nation itself received from the surrounding towns in the Hamptons and also Long Island, um, considering your waterfront right. <laughs> in the midst of some of the most affluent real estate. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because throughout the 20th century there have been these really um, sort of absurd attempts at taking 
what's left of the reservation away from us. So there was this uh, case called the Cove Realty case in the 20th century, where um, if you're familiar with Shinigak, it's the peninsula on um, a body of water. And what they were attempting to do is basically create a development right along the entirety of the uh, bottleneck of oh land. So if it did go through, um, in order to get to the reservation, you'd actually have to go through their property uh, each time. And um, luckily for us, we had a great, um, a lot of allies on our side through that whole process. So we were able to defend our territory mm -hmm. and um, kind of show that we still exist and have legitimate claims to our own land. Of course. Um, and in 2010, after we received federal recognition, that sort of paved the way and opened the gates to um, self-determination and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And um, since that point, there have been all these different uh, economic developments and plans in place. Um, I think more and more we're learning that we kind of have to take those chances and um, really show the world that we're not afraid to um, start these new ventures, and, um, whether it's economic or sure. in my case, more creative ways. Yes, absolutely. Well, recently there was a whole dispute regarding um, a new sign that was done for the Shinnecock Nation, showing the Shinnecock Nation seal and sort of kind of like a welcoming point. So it's still contested over what you as a people and your land you have jurisdiction over. Mm, absolutely. Um, about one or two months ago, um, one of two six-story tall billboards were constructed, and at the top of the uh, billboard is a seal of the Shinnecock Indian Nation, and it's been designated as sort of a half monument, half um, advertisement um, structure, and it runs right across um, Sunrise Highway in Hampton Bays, and just being able to watch um, people's reaction to it has been sort of uh, interesting because people who support Shinnecock in every single way mm -hmm. often get mixed feelings about <laughs> what the billboard is and okay. whether it should be there. Yeah. But for me, it's all about um, sort of the economic um, re revenue and resource. So in addition to being able to recognize Shinnecock territory, which it is, um, we're able to work with businesses to have revenue for future programming, mm -hmm. um, such as a police force, um, just different programs that will help boost us. And make you more self-sufficient. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, in discussion with land, um, one of your works from the project series on this site was shot at a private property in the town of Southampton. And it's my understanding that the property owner was developing the land to subdivide for houses. And during excavations, um, an Indian burial ground was discovered. Would you like to tell us about your documentation and involvement with that project and also the landowner in the town of Southampton? Absolutely. Um, well, since 2016, I've been working on a project called On This Site which documents um, similar sites. Um, what I uh, do as a process, I visit these sites, I research their significance, and I um, share publicly and in an open source way um, why it's important, why it needs to be preserved, mm -hmm. and hopefully that'll prevent future desecrations from happening. In uh, 2018, around our Labor Day weekend powwow, um, I remember the time because we had so many people out supporting us. Um, there was this uh, skull and uh, glass bottle that was found in the Shinnecock Hills on a site we call Hawthorne uh, in the Shinnecock Hills. And what happened was that on the very first day it was discovered, um, some of our Graves Protection Task Force members, mm -hmm. we went on site and sort of dictated what the police and detectives should do. And um, after many hours of kind of watching and seeing what they're going to des decide, um, they eventually sort of um, immediately took it out of the ground without any warning. Oh. And they were actually trying to dismiss it as sort of like a um, MS-13 crime scene. Really? Um, okay. 
So they didn't really have an understanding, but one of the things that I recognized was the glass bottle, which was iconic of uh, 17th century grave offerings. So the one that was found, it kind of looks like an alchemist bottle. Um, the walls of the bubble were about an inch thick. And um, I showed them a reference image from anthropology and archaeology records, and they kind of agreed that it was from Native American origins. So uh, Wonderful, so you had involvement in that. Absolutely. <laughs> that was a proud moment from the research I had done. Absolutely. And um, long story short, the owner worked with uh, the Community Preservation Fund in order to uh, preserve the site. Mm -hmm. So Southampton Town stepped forward. Um, many different individuals contributed to that fund mm -hmm. to purchase the lot. And uh, Connick Land Trust, which is the local Southampton nonprofit, they contributed a lot of money to help uh, this effort. So um, the lot at the moment is designated as a um, land for future preservation, so no one can develop it at this point. And uh, Southampton Town now owns it. Well, that's exceptional. A nice ending mm -hmm. to, unfortunately, something that never usually has a nice ending. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, going on to speak a bit about your art, your work, titled Nothing Happened Here, is part of a larger series of works dealing with assimilation, loss of land, and being overlooked in educational curriculums. What does the series of Nothing Happened Here represent for you? Mm. Well, um, immediately after on this site and researching for this entire year span, um, looking through archives and history books and biographies. I uh, took a break from that to work on something more creative. Um, I was awarded an artist residency at Vermont Studio Center and um, I was there with 40 other artists and I didn't really have uh, the reservation or Shinnecock as a subject. So I was wondering what can I do with all this potential and creativity in there. So, um, looking back at the research, I realized, well, why did I have to actually do this research in 2018 or 2017? Mm -hmm. Why didn't I learn all this in my educational um, programs and sure. public education? And it kind of felt like um, people knew in the back of their mind that there was some conflict with Native Americans, but most of it was so obscured that I created Nothing Happened Here as a response to that. Um, what does this kind of feeling of omitting history feel like? And um, I think a lot of people responded with a lot of understanding. Um, a lot of the people in the images themselves are volunteers, so they had a mutual understanding of the importance of the project. And um, I just wanted to portray that feeling of history staying with you. And um, if you look at the series and the portraits, it kind of feels like they don't know that they're being impaled by this um, array of arrows, but the viewer knows that there's something going on there. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the use of arrows, and we don't have um, one of his pieces is hanging here, but just not in the video right mm -hmm. now. And so there are figures that have arrows all over them. So what do the arrows represent in your image? Uh, for me, um, I don't want to narrow it down, but I would say that the arrows represent indigenous people being persistent, whether or not they're in the frame or not. Um, the arrows are symbolic of that presence and that um, historical burden. So it is sort of like this weight or this um, psychological effect that's being made tangible in the photograph. And um, there's a lot of different um, feedback and interpretations I received, but... Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> what forms of assimilation from contemporary Western society have been challenging for you as an artist, as well as your community? Um, as an artist, assimilation has been a big theme for my work because uh, I really do love spending time in archives and libraries. So, um, in, in regard to assimilation, I'm often trying to weave through different historical narratives to find uh, what's authentic, what has been made into either a religious um, iconography that's trying to assimilate Native people, mm -hmm. or a narrative in history that's 
trying to um, portray Native people as uh, either savage or um, sort of the negative person in the story. So assimilation for me is um, trying to look at storytelling in a way that um, is, is a little bit more truth telling. And especially as an indigenous artist, I'm able to um, sort of feel proud in that whole process to be able to um, just share our perspective from our voice. And it must be fascinating for you delving into archives and information that you uncover. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, great. So uh, behind us is one of Jeremy's photographs titled The Nightmare. It's part of a larger series from Jeremy's Rise series. So Jeremy, please go into description of the concept behind Rise and in particular The Nightmare. Oh, be happy to. Uh, Rise is a new series from 2018 that I'm very excited to work on. Um, it comes from uh, 17th century influences, the first one being the Pequot War of uh, 1637 and the King Philip War of uh, 1675. Uh, both of these wars take place in New England and um, being from Long Island, there's eventually a legacy from that history that affects us. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to counter in my project called Rise is the notion that at the conclusion of these two wars, um, where does that idea of indigenous um, vanishing come from? Do people think that Native Americans in the Northeast disappeared after that point? Or are we still in the world and still the neighbors of these areas? So me being from Eastern Long Island, it kind of, um, right there is your answer, I feel like. But most people don't get to see me and interact with me. So by creating this work, I'm able to share that message that we are still here. Um, on the surface, they kind of feel like something that's out of a suspense movie or a horror or a zombie movie. Sure, because <laughs> I mean, in um, the photograph here, because that's actually you um, dressed in traditional dress, um, just kind of pensive over this uh, woman's figure. And she has on a beautiful gown, kind mm -hmm. of a costume period piece, mm -hmm. European style. So there's a lot going on with the image. Tell me, what was it like, um, I guess, planning and shooting this? Well, this is shot um, within collaboration with an artist at Berkeley Colony mm -hmm. um, last year. And the aesthetic um, at Berkeley is actually very rustic. That's in a, a sort of like a half cabin, half mansion. Okay. And um, for me, it kind of reminded me of home and all of the houses along the water that you don't ever enter, like how luxurious they might look on the inside with um, okay. dark hardwood floors and like a luxurious chimney and everything that's featured in my work. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create an image where I'm sort of inside of these places. Um, the perception of indigenous people at that time in the 17th century is that we're all sort of violent and could attack at any time. Mm -hmm. But this image sort of shows um, me being passive in the self-portraiture. It's sort of like um, an interaction that's unsuspected. Um, so. That's what I hope to portray in the image at least. <laughs> no, it's beautiful with a lot coming on for it. Um, as we, I know we touched on this a bit, but as a contemporary Native American artist, what perceptions do you feel exist in society in regards to your culture? Hmm. Um, I would say some of what we spoke about in regard to uh, invisibility mm -hmm. of Native people. Um, most people are familiar with um, indigenous people in the South um, West, and um, being in New York, you feel like, especially so that you're invisible just because of um, the very little that people know about mm -hmm. um, Native American history. Um, and the Trail of Tears is a narrative of people moving westward. So in most people's mind, in the very basic sense, um, Native people aren't allowed to exist east of the Mississippi. On the East Coast. Yeah, yeah. especially <laughs> on the East Coast. Yes. Um, and being from the Hamptons, uh, South Hampton, 
um, there's a sense that it's only for wealthy people and people who have summer homes. Mm -hmm. So I feel like um, in a lot of my work I try to undo that um, simplification um, and especially at Shinnecock we don't really fit the stereotypes of what Native people look like with long straight hair and um, fair brown skin mm -hmm. um, high cheekbones. We um, vary so much in our appearance that um, we kind of have to remind people that we are Shinnecock despite what they might think about us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and then one thing I want to touch on, in the art world, do you ever sense um, contemporary Native American artwork is somehow at times being fetishized? And how do you overcome this as an artist? Mm -hmm. um, one thing I looked up recently was that um, in most art museums, their collections represent 75% uh, white male artists. Mm -hmm. while uh, in reality it's only 31% of um, the American demographic is actually a white male audience. So I think a lot of museums are being questioned about um, who they're representing and this is sort of an existential question for museums, um, especially in regard to who's going to museums and who's supporting them. Mm -hmm. um, I think being conscientious, they have to um, collect more indigenous and people of color in their collection. So um, part of the fetishization is that um, they might be collecting things decades after it was made um, outside of the context and history of that moment. So I'm, I'm always aware of um, when those things are being done and trying to pay attention to that um, linkage between when it's made and when the museum is um, perhaps fetishizing. Yeah, <laughs> sure, I understand. Well, thank you for going into that. So, Jeremy, your Parish Art and Museum Winter 2019 residency involved you teaching workshops to youth and students, and as well as having pieces on permanent exhibition during the residency. How do you feel your workshops left an impression with the students and if at all, did it open a dialogue for them to want to learn more about Native American culture? Uh, well, the Parish Art Museum um, worked very closely with me to design and initiate the program. And they actually did a very good job in introducing who I am to the students by going to the classrooms um, a few days before I even met the students. Oh, wow. So they had a sense of who Shinnecock people are, who I am in that whole context, and um, they had a lot of questions immediately upon entering the parish for the workshop. So I think they kind of built the environment in a way that's conducted to learning and uh, education. So uh, the workshop involved uh, collage, um, myself doing storytelling, and then creating artwork based on that combination. So I felt like it was a very uh, positive experience, both for me and the students to learn about Native American Sure, culture. and with the, the collage and storytelling, that's so engaging mm -hmm. for students. Yeah, everyone had a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, Jeremy, how do you envision your practice evolving over time? Uh, one thing that kind of um, speaks to a whole of our interviews so far is the idea of um, kind of going out into the world. Um, here I'm at Governor's Island, like three or four hours away from home. And what I want to try to do in my future work is um, find those opportunities for where home could be essentially. Mm -hmm. um, because so much of my work is based on Eastern Long Island and our history and our ancestry. Um, I do feel like home is permanent in that way. We always have a place to go back to. But at the same time, I, I kind of want to feel like I'm more welcome in the rest of the world. So finding traces of indigenous uh, presence for me is very fascinating. Mm -hmm. I just want to find um, different elements or symbolism in the world yeah. of uh, where we are and where we belong and uh, share our story in that way. Well, I look forward to seeing future work and seeing updates for your project on this site. And Jeremy, thank you for being here with us in the American Indian community.
Community House. Uh, I do. Absolutely. It's been an honor having your art here on exhibit. And thank you so much.